statistically, there's going to be a certain percentage of people that want to abuse kids and they'll gravitate towards those positions. So when those types of situations, you should have an active check in where you're not just waiting for, okay, another case, like another kid got fucked. Like now we got to, you know, move this priest around. It's like, no, you have to check in with the actual people and take an active approach and, and asking them what is the state of being like how, how are they feeling on a day-to-day basis what's up guys thank you for tuning in to this episode of the podcast before we start this is a quick announcement to let you guys know that i'm dropping bonus episodes on auxoro premium for less than five dollars per month when you sign up for the year you get a two-hour bonus episode every month of my show the aux that covers exciting and sometimes twisted topics like MK Ultra, the COVID lab leak hypothesis, Tim Dillon, Tom Cruise, the Tuskegee experiment, the obesity epidemic, and more. You also get monthly solo episodes with my takes on drugs, sex, money, creativity, mindfulness, and you have the ability to submit topic suggestions for both of my shows, The Ox and The Oxoro Podcast. Expect three hours of new exclusive podcast content per month, including access to all archived episodes found nowhere else but Auxoro Premium. Visit auxoro.supercast.com to sign up today. This is the best deal in podcasting. Three hours of exclusive podcast content to punch you in the motherfucking mouth every month for less than five bucks. No half-assed episodes here. Go to auxoro.supercast.com to join the premium gang today. What's going on, guys? This week on The Ox, we have an episode on Larry Nasser and the Athlete A scandal. The piece of shit, rapist, molester, Larry Nasser, who was a trainer for USA Gymnastics. Over 368 athletes, uh, female athletes, have come forward with accusations of sexual assault and molestation and rape against the disgraced Olympic gymnast, Larry Nasser, And I wanted to do this episode because, A, I mean, it's, it's something that at the time was all over the media. There's a Netflix documentary, which we refer to a lot, and it's in the title of the episode, Athlete A. And shout out to the Indie Star in Indianapolis for breaking this story and bringing it to people's attention nationwide. I also wanted to uh, cover this topic and get into what Larry Nasser did. Besides the, the size of the story is that I come from an athletic background myself and I have a lot of friends who have been female college athletes and I've had a lot of interactions with trainers and I've had a lot of interactions with uh, my friends who are women who have been in training environments, training room environments, and nothing that, nothing bad has ever happened to me as a guy. I mean, I've never felt unsafe in a training room. None of my friends who are women have told me about negative experiences they've had in the training room. Um, but I know as an athlete that you put a lot of trust in your trainer. And even in college, when, when my trainer said something, they, it comes with credentials, it comes with weight behind it. And you want to believe them, you want to get better, you want to do whatever you need to do to stay on the field. And that is why what a trainer tells you and what a trainer does to you is so important. The, the athlete-trainer relationship is something sacred that, in my opinion, only the worst type of people violate. I would have done fucking anything to be on the baseball field towards the end of my career when I was having two surgeries and wasn't able to perform whatever my trainer told me, even if there was a 10% chance of it working, I would have done it to be out there. And that's why I think, besides the the actual sexual acts and the, the molestation that Larry Nasser was committing against these athletes who were basically children at the time. A lot of them, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, they would do anything to be out there at the Olympic level. And I, I've never even brushed the Olympic level. So I know anything that I felt about performance was only magnified a thousand times for these girls on the Olympic stage. And 
they must have put so much trust into this guy. They they he he must have been, and and we'll get into it. He was acting friendly and giving them gifts and building trust with them and doing things to build that relationship and build that trust only to tear the entire thing down with rape and and sexual assault and getting these girls alone and doing unspeakable things to them and it's so super super fucked because these girls train their entire fucking lives and and they're in such a vulnerable position where as a trainer you can talk to them and make them think that what what you need to do to them is okay and it's a proper treatment and this will allow you to perform better and I'm gonna, you know, finger blast you a little bit and that will allow you to get out there and compete on the mat. And of course, (laughs) that was not true. There's no reason to put your fingers inside a 15-year-old girl to allow her to compete on the Olympic stage, let alone any stage. There's no athletic treatment that calls for that. And in this episode, we get into a lot of the uh, voices of the victims in the Athlete Aid documentary. We hear testimony from uh, Michaela Maroney, Simone Biles. Uh, we get into the experiences of Jamie Dancher. We also get into documents that were shown in the Athlete A documentary we get into possible fbi cover-up the 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 sick mo of larry nasser and how he went about what he was doing and how he got away from it for so long the culture of olympic gymnastics and is it really different are, are things different today we get into all of it today on the ox and so thank you for coming along on this journey with me i i hope that this episode does a decent job of getting across the spirit of not only larry nasser but more importantly what the victims went through and what their parents went through hearing all this shit and the culture of what it it wasn't just larry nasser it was the culture of usa gymnastics that was enabling him to molest these girls over and over and over again so without further ado please enjoy this episode of the aux we do a two hour deep dive into athlete a and the larry nasser cover-up so today are we rolling we're rolling dude oh wow that was on that was on tape fuck all right we're doing we're doing a soft start and I'm defeating the purpose of the soft start right now by telling you it's a soft start because usually we just keep rolling and and that's how it starts. Yeah, I mean, we're both hopefully soft as well right now. So I'd, I'd hope that this is a... I it, think it, it would feel wrong to get aroused during this topic because it is Athlete A and the Larry Nasser cover-up. So I would hope yeah. that... Uh, well, I'm fine. Are you? <laughs> are you <laughs> Are you good? <laughs> uh, I'm good. Uh, All right. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> any boners that I get throughout the course of this podcast will be purely incidental. And that's what I'll say to my lawyer. Well, you already spoke. So, you, you know, you, uh, so, so what do you know about the athlete, a situation and the Larry Nasser situation with USA gymnastics? What, what was your understanding of what happened before you watched the documentary, before you got into any of the sources, what was kind of your, take of the whole situation it seemed to be a case of just another you know i I think there's so many you know individual sexual molestation cases or assault cases but this seemed to be just another example of that but just a deeply entrenched case of it because it involved a huge organization instead of just let's say a case in college because you know there's a lot of individual cases that we might not hear of but then you have this guy here who committed these crimes and it it seemed like it was a case of it being part of a gymnastic association 
and just getting away with it. But the surprising part is that it was just so many, it was so widespread. I think that's a thing that shocked people and so unreported. So I think, I think that shocked people the most about this case and how long it went on without being reported. So yeah, there's a, we'll get to the testimonies towards the end, but there's a quote from Michaela Maroney when she testified in front of Senate and she says, if they're not going to protect me, who are they trying to protect? And when I was going through the athlete, a documentary and the indie star sources and, and firsthand accounts of the gymnasts, and other people involved in the whole situation, a common theme was, you know, why are these Olympians, these little girls, because they were girls at the time. A lot of these girls were 13, 14 years old when all this abuse started. A lot of what popped into my mind was exactly that. If, if they're not protecting the Olympians, if the USAG, USA Gymnastics is not protecting the Olympians, who are they protecting? Why are they letting this go on? Why are these reports uh, being covered up? which we'll get into and then some, you know, I, but before watching Athlete A, before doing research to prepare for this episode, I had heard the name Larry Nasser. I knew there was something fucked up going on in USA Gymnastics, just as kind of like a peripheral observer of what was going on, where I had heard some things and knew that there was some sort of toxic situation going on in gymnastics. I didn't really mm. know exactly what was happening i didn't know there was molestation going on i'd heard the name in the news read some of the headlines did not look further into it and then when the 2020 olympics rolled around i uh, one of the headlines was that simone biles was she she dropped out of one of the competitions she dropped yeah. out and she didn't compete and my first thought was like i wonder why you would work so hard for four years only to drop out of the competition. And I think she cited mental health reasons and um, I don't want to uh, speak for her, but said something about mental health. And I, I thought, why would you, why would you not just go through with the competition? Why would you right. know, not just perform regardless of how you were feeling just because you've put all that work into it? Yeah, I'll be honest. I was, I was skeptical too. I was in the bandwagon of what's going on here. Like if you're an athlete, finished a competition everyone faces hardships you know and that's part of the game i was like what are you doing here is it is it just is the new thing just to uh when you face a loss then then you make an excuse that you have a mental health issue like i'll be honest i that came into my head which is now thinking about this backstory with how bad things were for her to makes total sense. No one has any I, fucking idea of what she went through at all. Like, and yeah, I, I they thought, had trouble speaking up. Yeah, so. I, I was from my own athletic background. I, I was questioning, you know, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want to compete for something you've been working so hard for? Why would you drop out of a competition? You know, even if you're, if I'm on my deathbed, if I just trained four years for something, I'm just gonna say fuck it. And even if I don't win the gold medal, I'm not feeling good. I'm just gonna compete. And I kind of, I was definitely in the camp of, you know, just fucking go out there, just compete, whatever. And then when I was reading all of this stuff and how she was being abused by Larry Nasser and sexually assaulted and going through this for years and then hearing Simone Biles talk about having to travel to Tokyo by herself because of the rules, her family and friends weren't allowed to come. Yeah. She was being put in the same situation uh, Larry Nasser wasn't there for this Olympics, but she was surrounded by similar things, similar people, a lot of triggers. And yeah. imagine, I was trying to imagine for myself, if I had just had this, you know, fucked up thing happen to me for years and then I was thrown back into it. I don't know how I would react when it came time to compete. So this definitely and, and there's gave a me some more empathy for her for her situation and and some more context as to why she dropped out because there were there really wasn't a lot going into it uh, a lot of coverage of her dropping out like the details there was a lot of headlines Simone Biles drops out but yeah there wasn't really any connection to this and then when I started reading this I'm like oh like she well, got just, fucking raped for years I know that just shows like I got caught up with in it and that just shows you know, people are just commenting online. Everyone has their opinion immediately of what happened and how we have these like quick 
reactions without research. That's like the story of social media. And people, you know, think about what she's been through, especially with this documentary we're going to talk about. There's so much behind it. So you have to consider sometimes what people have been, been through. Go, having gone through anxiety myself, like she's been through training that like is nonstop for your entire life, your, your entire childhood to be a perfect gymnast and then combine that with be with being sexually assaulted and also knowing people that are sexually assaulted. Like I could, I can understand there taking, taking a seat for a little bit. So it makes sense to me now. Yeah. It, it made sense before, but now I'm, I, I have an even deeper understanding with this documentary. So. Yeah, I, I just want to give a shout out to the two sources before we start the getting into the, the Hellman's the mayonnaise or, or was it? Yeah, Hellman, was it? sponsored by Hellman's mayonnaise. mayonnaise? Um, so Athlete A documentary that's on Netflix and then also the Indie Star, which broke a lot of the news stories. I looked at a bunch of those original articles and pulled a bunch of things from there. So shout out to Indie Star and also the people who made Athlete A on Netflix. You said thank you like you're you're taking credit. For I'm, wait, I'm just getting journalism. I'm just getting you, communication from Athlete A right now. They're and okay, and they said to say thank you for okay sponsorship. Per- perfect, <laughs> perfect. So the the background with how this all came to be, how this predatory coach Larry Nasser came into the spotlight. So there was a tip to a journalist at the I believe she was at the Indy Star at the time, Maria Kwiatkowski. There's a tip to this. And what is the Indy Star? It's a newspaper. It's like the New York Times, but for Indianapolis. Yep. And so there's a tip to this woman, Maria Kwiatkowski, and she was looking into sexual assault in school districts, and she was trying to find out how systemic sexual assault happens, and she was tipped off about a USA Gymnastics predatory coach. Someone basically sent her an email. This was in the beginning of the documentary, and they're like, hey, if you're interested in sexual assault go check out what USA Gymnastics is doing. And she found a file on a coach, William McCabe, that had multiple reports on him assaulting gymnasts, uh, young female gymnasts, all the way back to, I believe, 1997, 1996. And there was one quote from the file that says, this coach needs to be put in a cage before he rapes somebody. Yeah. <laughs> this coach That's... needs to be put in a cage before he rapes somebody. And USA Gymnastics did nothing. And the coach was kind of, he was kind of moved around. Yeah. Like Catholic priests. When I was reading about this, it, it reminded me of what happened with Spotlight pre- priests in the it. church. Yeah, yeah. Like if you, if you abused a kid, the first line of action was not to get to the root of the abuse and then penalize the, the priest who was, uh, getting sucked off by young boys, but rather just move them around to get continually sucked off as they move through different parishes and wreak havoc on kids' psyches. And so when I heard about the USA Gymnastic coaches being moved around, it kind of made me think about that whole systemic problem of when a sexual assault happens in the Catholic Church, you kind of get tossed into another church, almost like a piece. It's it's kind of like a, it's like a sexual assault Ponzi scheme where you're just like passing the assault around until finally all the chips, like someone's just like, this can't happen anymore. There's no more churches to put this guy. And they're like, well, I guess we'll have to report it now. And so yeah. it's, it sounded like they were doing a similar thing where they were moving gymnastic coaches around these different gyms. And that was their response to yeah that's um a report where they that someone said this coach needs to be put in a cage before he rapes somebody any other comp well hopefully most other companies if you receive that email and that goes to hr like that's a <laughs> that's a huge issue but it was just kind of um buried here and uh why is that happening why is it just buried but the similarity between priests and um these trainers or doctors is that they're both in positions of, they're both in positions of authority with access to children, which might be able to explain why the, the the prevalence of assault in both of these organizations. So like Larry Nasser, he was a, he is a medical doctor with medical training and he has access to like a continuous stream of girls coming into his office. And when you have 
eight plus years of training, no one questions where you're going to touch and, you know, or at least maybe when you're younger, you question it even less. But when you have so much training, people kind of just, they kind of just trust you. And both priests and doctors seem to have that. But I mean, I guess we're just harping on these two now because of the metaphor, but both priests and doctors both have that access. And it seems that that seems to be a theme that if, if you have that access, something can boil up, you know. That, in that situation. What's up, guys? This is a quick break in the episode to remind you that if you like this conversation, you'll love Auxoro Premium. Go to auxoro.supercast.tech to gain access to bonus episodes, the ability to suggest topics, and all premium archives for only $3 per month, two if you sign up for the year. Again, that's auxoro.supercast.tech. Link in the podcast notes. Now, Back to the episode. If you if you were yeah. to make a formula to sexually assault young uh, children and teenagers, it would be you have to get into a position of trust. So something like a gymnastics coach or a priest where people are seeking you out and your position of authority. And then you're also around kids all the time. And, and I feel like that's obvious right now. When you have those type of situations, you're going to have a higher percentage of people that are being abused just because of the combination of power, trust, and access. And so why do we wait for cases to be reported to do something? Why not actively check in with the kids in these positions and actively ask questions and just say things like, hey, you know, has anything uh, weird been going on with, uh, like, do you feel okay with Coach Nasser or Father Tom? And right. has he has he done this to you? Like, does he touch you anywhere that makes you feel uncomfortable? Or does he, d- does he do things that don't seem right yeah. all the time? Like, to actively go to the kids and, and say, you know, like... Continuous. It's a higher chance. Yeah, it's a higher chance with the the power, trust, and access. You're you're gonna attract people naturally. Statistically, there's gonna be a certain percentage of people that want to abuse kids, and they'll gravitate towards those positions. So, when those types of situations, you should have an active check in where you're not just waiting for okay, another case, like another kid got fucked. Like now we gotta, you know, move this priest around. It's like no, you have to check in with the actual people. And take an active approach and, and asking them, what is the state of being? Like, wow, how are they feeling on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, and you don't get that checking in. I think you're right with the recipe there. Like, it's such a perfect storm. Like, it's everything you said and then add in, like, mental illness, I guess, or just predator. I mean, I guess being a, being a child predator is considered mental illness. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, some, but, something something yeah. is off. <laughs> yeah, it's but, like uh, if God if God it, is making, for, for all the, those people who believe in God and, and that he wants, uh, you know, he's an all-powerful, omniscient being, which I, I grew up Catholic, I'm an atheist now, but when God is making people... I'll, I'll, we'll talk about converting you later. But Yeah, yeah we'll what, uh, y- y- there'll, there'll be a guy who knocks at the door <laughs> and, and asks me, um, if I've seen Jesus, so Zach, get on your knees, and if you don't obey Jesus, I'm going to shoot you right now. Are you just saying things that you said before we started recording? <laughs> <laughs> Are you just repeating things you've said today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. I saw Zach earlier today. On- yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's like for people, uh, even if you don't believe in God, like just let's say there is a God, and he's God's like, yeah, I've made two million people. Statistically, I should make a sexual predator now. He's like, all right, I got to sprinkle in a little bit of power. A little bit sprinkle of the in a little bit of trust. Brownie bites. He had, yeah. He had. He did the twi- He did the gummies. Now he does the brownie bites of the. Uh, the bad guys. Yeah, no, no joke. Larry Nasser actually, uh, a lot of the gymnasts testify that he would give them treats. Like he would leave really candy and food Jesus Christ underneath their pillow. He would. He was giving. I think of Michaela Maroney. He would bring her caramel macchiato. So he was going out of his way to be nice to these girls and give them presents and give them treats because it was such a harsh environment. In Olympic training that he was like the escape for a lot of these girls they would go talk to him and he was the quote unquote nice guy and so part of that was like the stereotypical uh like the guy in the white van with candy he was basically doing that to these girls like giving them treats but people see you most people see a white van and they're like that's a fucking sketchy 
guy dude, and, named and, Mark. And you and, 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 and you see up. a white van, you're yeah. like, why am I driving this? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I say, why haven't I picked anyone up yet why, today? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> like this neighborhood, this, this neighborhood's, I'm not getting any people hits. Are, people are smart here. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, I was driving around a nursing home, Shit. that's why. Yeah, they just couldn't walk outside. That's yeah. what it was. But um, no, but that's, that's, uh, uh, did I, did I lose my train of thought? Yeah. You were saying he was, he, he gives you, some You candy. lost your van of thought. Lost my van of thought. Your white van of thought. My van of thought. I'll, that's, that's going to be my, my saying from now on. Maybe, maybe I'll get it back. That's actually what I'm going to be leaving in after this. Maybe, maybe I'll but, get it back. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I was just going to say from, I assisted doctors in the past and just knowing that like patients, they just walk in and a lot of them give their selves to the doctor and say like, what do I have to do with my body to feel better? Cause I have pain right now. So basically when people walk into a doctor's office, they're just like, they're vulnerable and they're like ready to, most people are ready to listen for advice because that's why you studied that long and did that much training. And I would say hopefully like 99 or percent or more, more doctors are not these types of people. But this guy just happened to be a guy with like that had trust, but also was taking advantage of it like severely and was also like obviously sick in the head. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, it's it's a completely different thing. But this whole situation made me think about baseball and the, and the tradition authority mindset, which is prevalent in a lot of sports where you're you're with someone in a position of authority and there's no assault or anything sexual going on but someone tells you this is how it is or, or this is how we do things and, and maybe your coach just does it and shows you and you don't even think twice about it because you trust your coach and and you know you know if he's a good coach and he's proven that to you over time your coach is doing things to get you better and so you rational even when something like you know is bad i've, I've been told to do bad things in the weight room or, or but also bad things a, on the field you rationalize it in your yeah. head to say oh well this coach wants the best for me so th there must be some reason behind why this is happening there must be some reason why this person is doing to me what they're doing and then that sets up a whole cycle where the coach tells you one thing and then you do it. And then maybe like the next time, like maybe you question it a little bit at first and then um, he explains it in a way that makes sense. And when you're doing that on a regular basis, you get good at explaining things. And like, I, it seems like I saw Larry Nasser speak a few times in, in interviews and he also talks in the documentary and he, he seems like a guy that's very medically he has a very good medical terminology and very aware of how he sounds as an expert and he uses his title as an expert and he's very and, so soft spoken yeah too. he's like he he commands his medical terminology in a way to gain trust from people and he's very aware of what he's doing what did ted and, bundy do you know yeah ted, he <laughs> yeah he, he also drove a white van yeah no, i have no idea we'll find out when we do a podcast on him with him yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we'll dig him up but and i don't even know if he, is he dead is he dead ted is bundy he... is wow we should know this i think he's i'm gonna i'm gonna go with dead yeah i think he's dead but um well yeah. you just texted him yesterday to see ask him ted? <laughs> why am i speaking through headphones yeah but uh, i was also gonna say there's another there's another thing there's another aspect to that like you also there's also a thing where you probably felt with baseball and so did these girls if you go against what's happening you might get cut from the team mm -hmm. that must have been a huge aspect like oh you go against your trainer your trainer's like oh do this workout if you go against him you might be cut from the team or not played so these girls must have felt like okay if i rat out the doctor or keep saying too much my dream is to get to uh, tokyo or not tokyo olympics wherever it was and i'm not going to get there because uh i just spoke out against the most prominent olympic gymnast yeah. doctor right now so this is this is another wild thing yeah. so usa gymnastics held on to 54 complaint files on sexual abuse so they basically had these abuse files stuffed in a drawer literally like a file cabinet and stephen penny who was the president of usag while this is all happening usag's usa uh, usa gymnastics he didn't report the complaints if they were not signed by a parent or victim so Olympians and other people that overheard conversations would go forward. There would be kind of rumblings going on. There were 54 complaint files on sexual abuse. And Stephen Penny, the president, would not report these to the police or the FBI because a parent or victim 
didn't sign this. And and to yeah, me, to me, so that's absurd. I know there are rules that go along with these things, but like if you're a, if you're a, the president of USA Gymnastics and you overhear a, two girls talking about how the trainer's been touching them weird and you yeah. don't file it because they haven't signed the complaint or maybe they don't want to sign the complaint. Yeah, they because, feel embarrassed. Yeah, that, and, and that's the whole point of the documentary Athlete A is that Maggie Nichols, the, the girl who originally spoke up about this, she came forward as Athlete A. She didn't want to share her name. So you, you may not want to come out against gymnastics because you're trying to get to the Olympics. You're you're trying to also further your own career. So I would understand people not wanting to sign the complaint and, and file these complaints in case it becomes public. And so it's it seems really absurd. And then Indie Star uh, released the story. Like they they released a story about USA Gymnastics, the whole failure to report abuse in 2016. And then when that story came out three women who didn't know each other at the time came forward to indie star it was uh, rachel den hollander jamie dancher and jessica howard they saw the story that uh there was evidence of files uh not being reported to police sexual complaints not being uh, reported to police sexual abuse and then three women who who didn't know each other didn't train together didn't uh like weren't friends they all came forward separately to the indie star and said, yeah, like this happened to me. And that, that was kind of the, the beginning of what happened is, is that there, there were, the, the Indie Star article was, was released, I, I believe it was September 2016. And then we're going to backtrack a little bit to Maggie Nichols because Maggie Nichols actually came out before all this. She was a USA gymnast. Um, she came out separate to the story, but Indie Star reported uh, that there was shit going on with USA Gymnastics. Three more gymnasts came forward, and then that opened the floodgates for hundreds more women coming forward. That's like Dana. Like that's like a that's like Dana White being the CEO of UFC, and then a, a fighter assaulting like like a ring girl, and then him saying, "All right, unless she signs this document, this didn't happen." And I'm just gonna throw it in my uh, Manila folder here in my office. No, that's yeah. crazy. So it, uh, I, also, you don't like the victim doesn't always willingly. Uh, I think the victim, yeah, is embarrassed, and they don't want to necessarily be the one to come forward. That's why it takes so much time for them sometimes to come forward because they're not ready to admit what happened to them. It just kills their ego and their sense of dignity that they because they've just been taken advantage of. Yeah. So they're just like, what the fuck just happened to me? Well, they I don't want to. They don't want to immediately be like, okay, I was assaulted by Larry Nassar, and everyone's like, why didn't you say it one day after it happened? Because, yeah. because no, it's, I, I used to be more in that mindset yeah. where I, I thought that a person or a woman, whoever it was, the the sooner you came forward with the allegations, the more likely it was to be true. And so uh, when the Me Too movement came out and people, uh, especially women, were coming out with stories of abuse that happened like 17 years ago, in my head, I, I thought, you know, why, like, if this happened, why not say something at the time? Yeah. And my view has drastically changed on that, where I, I've heard stories of women come forward. I've I've heard, you know, like all the pain and the the trauma that can be a huge obstacle in you coming forward about something that happens like that. And I, I don't know, it's yeah. nothing like that has ever happened to me. So I know my own brain kicks in and, and I think back to sports a lot where I'm like, I had a problem. If I don't speak up about this problem, nothing's going to change. So if you want this to change, speak up. Why are you waiting even a day to tell someone about it? If it really happened, you would tell someone about it. And there's a quote from Rachel, uh, Rachel Den Hollander one of the original athletes that came forward, she said, quote, I didn't know a lot when I was 15, but one thing I did know was that abuse victims aren't treated well. They are mocked, they are questioned, they are blamed, and they are shamed. Yeah. And that does incredible damage to the healing process. I wish I could have dealt with it 16 years ago. I don't think I could have, but I can now. So you're also yeah. a teenager, yeah. and you might not have the capacity to emotionally process and communicate something like 
you know, this, this Larry Nasser's finger blasting these girls they, they on the table. They might not have fully processed it. They might not have even known it was 100% incorrect. That's yeah. how young they were. They might have just been like, okay, this is a really invasive procedure, you know, and it's so bad because Larry Nasser took advantage of their age yeah. and probably they were probably like, oh, they'll just, there are false accusations that happen like with, you know, the Duke class uh, yeah, or Duke the, lacrosse. the Duke lacrosse, like it, it does happen, but, and it's weird because like when there's something that uh, occurs with like an accusation that it's not really correct, but you almost have to start off being skeptical in order to look at the evidence. But in this case, uh, obviously like everything occurred and this guy was crazy. So you're right. Like uh, people, people just don't immediately come forward on things like this. Yeah, no, especially I would imagine if you get sexually assaulted, especially as a, a child or a young teenager, like, like you, I, I remember having trouble as a teenager, just expressing normal things that were happening to me. Like I my mom like mom would buy us t-shirts and i didn't know how to tell my mom that i didn't like this t-shirt i was just yeah, like i'll just have, wear this you have now like 400 of them still yeah i was like i'll, I'll just wear this this is my uh, t-shirt i'm wearing every day now and so I, like if, if i'm if teenagers have trouble saying simple things like that and you get assaulted and there, there's this guy that's molesting you mom i hope you're not watching this thank you i hope she is actually i hope um, you are <laughs> this is still this is my uh, my truth. <laughs> if you get if you get molested as a, a teenager, <laughs> and y you are already in a state where you're anxious, you're developing, you have hormones coursing through your body, and now you have some man that's molesting you, and you're trying to get it out and, and figure out a way to communicate it. I could see how that gets easily buried, yeah. and especially when it's a position of authority where you are trusting this person and you also need them to move forward in your career this guy probably yeah. had the power to say oh this gymnast you know she's hurt or she can't compete because he, he was the doctor he was the trainer or for 18 say, oh, years my hand slipped you know yeah i yeah. It, it slipped in your vagina 47 times for yeah. uh, 47 exactly. days straight it's crazy i don't know how he would explain that um, but he might he might have made something up yeah it's uh but yeah, the the me you brought up a good point is that um about the Me Too movement. The, like that, the the tough thing is that you kind of have to initially you have to be skeptical first and find the evidence. Right? Yes. So so what yeah. what what I what, what I thought about the Me Too movement when I'm going through this whole case uh, this whole situation is that the, here's an example of a story that was shared by the Indie Star that empowered other women to come forward about the sexual abuse and then that started this whole basically trickle of women hundreds of women coming forward about Larry Nasser and I don't think that would have happened without someone I, I don't think it would have been as powerful I don't and I, I don't think it uh, would have happened without the the me too movement and that whole mentality shift where people are sharing their assault stories their sexual abuse stories molestation that does empower women and it when someone shares their experience it empowers you to come forward and with that there will be a percentage of people i think a small percentage of people that will just lie and make shit up to ride a wave and, and it's not just the me too movement it, it's any movement like any movement can uh, be joined yeah like like black Li like black lives matter you have you have people you, you have black people that have had shitty things done to them because they're black racist acts and then you get someone like jesse smollett that hops on the bandwagon of black lives matter and the whole racially charged situation in america and he took advantage of that and so i think any big movement you have it's not specific to me too you will have people that are riding a wave and, and again, I think it's a very small percentage of people, but you still have to be vigilant to, you know, once the victims come forward, when, once they've said things to, to collect facts, to process evidence, to mm -hmm. listen to multiple women, you know, like if, if 47 different women that barely know each other come out against one guy, like it's, it's pretty, probably, it's probably true. Bill yeah. Cosby. You yeah. Know. And, and this situation it's probably true. Yeah. But yeah, it's tough. A lot of people want to say, like, believe all women. And I don't think you should believe all of anyone or of any group. There, there's nuance to right. movements like Me Too. And people either want to say, you know, like, fuck Me Too, like such a bullshit movement. A lot of men get in trouble that don't deserve it, which is true. 
I think that that comes with any movement. You can't have a large movement and a large shift and it doesn't make the turmoil and, and the people who get caught up in it wrongly, that doesn't make it right. That's something that just comes with huge societal shifts in the way that we think and the way that we do things. It's an, it's an unfortunate side effect of our society becoming better in the way that we treat women is that some guys have been thrown under the bus and grouped unfairly. And that's why we always need to stay vigilant and listen to stories and be careful and, and trust people, but also verify what they're saying. So, so the me too, I don't see it as black and white. I see it as nuanced that yes, overall it is a good thing that empowers women, but also you will have like pieces right. of shit that try to ride the wave for notoriety and claim things that didn't happen to them for social clout and use it as a form of currency. Right. It's given voice to women and, uh, but you have to check. That's it. You got to check the truth. But this, in this case, this is a, it's a win for the Me Too movement. This whole Larry Nasser case. This is a huge. You know, I'm happy that these girls were heard because th this is insane. The amount of the amount of things that's that have been done to them. Yeah. So, dude. So let's uh, let's also give credit to Maggie Nichols because she was the first gymnast to come out back in 2015. Yeah. When she was still. Uh, an Olympian. She's part of USAG. She came out against Larry Nasser as athlete A in 2015. She filed the report, which again is the comes from the, the, the documentary Maggie Nichols. Maggie Nichols, you're right. Uh, the first allegations Shit. of Nasser were back in 1997 at MSU, but uh, she was um, she was so the first one that kind of started the wave. Okay, so in college, he had the first thing come out. He but was, he was Olymp working at Michigan State. In yeah. the Olympics, he had. The Olympics is when it all really started, right? Yeah, the first girl to come out against Larry Nasser was Maggie Nichols. She got the entire ball rolling. Uh, she came out as athlete A back in 2015. Maggie Nichols reported the abuse in 2015. And then Stephen Penny waited five weeks until he told the FBI. Yeah. yeah, the FBI. And you remember that part of the documentary? Yeah. he's uh, Well, he's the same one that said that... They, Victim need to the victims need to sign something, right? That's what. He, yeah, he's same, the same, same guy one. that and, said this. So, and then, I mean, yeah, and then he sat on it for five weeks um, before saying anything to the FBI. And the, uh, like you would think, I'm just wondering, like, is there some sort of like this happened with Sandusky too? Like someone saw something but didn't really say anything immediately. Like, is it like a? Is it? Do you think it's because it's like? how much of it is like saving their asses and how much of it is like because it's like awkward or like taboo or something and like people just don't want to get involved it's like a bystander effect where you're just kind of like i don't like i don't want to be the guy to like say something or ruin our or do you think it's more that like i don't want to ruin my own org organization i th it, i think money fucks with people's heads uh, if you're so stephen penny is a marketing guy he was brought into usa gymnastics right. oh, yeah. to take care of marketing yes and so when you're in that position imagine you're stephen penny and women's usa gymnastics is is killing it they're bringing in gold medals with uh uh, Michaela Maroney, Gabby Douglas, Simone Biles, like all the women before them, they're getting millions of dollars a year. Yeah, in sponsorships from things like uh, I think it's like Wheaties, Kellogg's. Like when you see girls in, in car commercials and, and cereal boxes, I'm pretty sure USA Gymnastics, whatever deal they have, they get a cut of that, and so they have millions of dollars. They have this brand that they've created because it is a brand. It's USA Gymnastics, and then when you have someone like Larry Nasser who comes in and throws a fucking cog in that wheel that is the, the huge brand of gymnastics, it's not right. It's, it's a horrific, tragic decision that Stephen Penny made to wait five weeks to report it to the FBI. But he, in his head, I imagine he's thinking about all the work he's done in marketing for USA Gymnastics, the deals, the partnerships, and he's valuing the money coming into gymnastics over admitting that they have a sexual predator on their coaching staff and have for years because the complaints went back to like uh, he was there for 18 years as a trainer they went back to almost the time he first started so it looks bad first of all and i think also again the the money money does weird things to people's heads stephen penny's just a p he's still a piece of shit and he's 
in prison now, I believe, and he deserves to be in prison. But like when you have a situation like that, things get blurred and you can convince yourself you could he probably said things to himself like oh that like they're just girls they're they're lying or they're making things up or you know they need to be tougher and and shit like that and yeah well he saw he might have seen a marketing campaign and been like well i can only do things that are bolster the, the our image so yeah he this va- is not he, one of them he mm. valued the <laughs> dollar over so. the the well-being of the girls yeah and i know people have to make a living but there's a there's a line though and that's the line you you report that shit because just because of what it is i i this whole thing i'm like is the concept of long-term well-being a thing anymore i feel like if you are thinking about okay what what kind of person do i want to be in 10 years where do i want to be in 10 15 20 years down the line it is a no brain like besides the fact that it's the right thing to do and that you have girls being molested right underneath your nose you also have the concept of i want to have this job 10 20 years from now i want to continue to make money i want to build good relationships and so Stephen Penny could not have been thinking about anything outside of the six months or the year that he was making the decision because he's just like, I want to keep the money coming in for USA Gymnastics. I want to cover this shit up. I'm not going to report it. Eventually he did. But it's like, I feel like that's so lost nowadays, the concept of long term thinking and taking a second and going, okay, if I make this decision, what will my life look like a year from now? What will my life look like five years from now? What will my life look like 20 years from now? And there, there was not a single second where Stephen Penny thought about what are the what's the life of these girls, you know, five years from now, a year from now? What's my life going to be five years from now? I'm going to be thrown in jail for covering up pedof- uh, pedophilia. Uh, girls are going to, innocent girls are going to continually be sexually assaulted. Yeah. He's going to get other jobs at other places after USA Gymnastics. You know, what is he doing when he's not at work? Like, is he like assaulting his daughter or like, what, like, what is the shit? I just don't know what goes through people's heads. Sometimes. Human, humans are not good long-term thinkers. Like they're not good at sacrifice, like porn, gambling, sex, w- weed, drugs, those are all short. Are you just saying things uh, that you Porn. did again everything, before this podcast? Everything I've done this weekend. This today. That's yes. it. I, I, everything I've done in the last hour. But well, like, we've been recording for 42 minutes, so that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, you didn't see the really quick transfers to the phone. Yeah. Lighting up. Good. But uh, th- we're just like, that's, those are all dopamine hits, dopamine highs, like, and we're good at, we're so, humans are good at just seeing a lot of short term satisfaction we're not really good at thinking i mean why do we not think about like climate change is hard to think about now because it's going to happen later or uh, like the huge the detrimental changes will happen down the line that's why we don't like people some people don't care as much so like that's why uh, this guy thought in in the moment he was like you know he's probably thinking about money or saving his ass or something he probably wasn't thinking about things down the line it's hard to think honestly it's hard to sacrifice and and discipline yourself for uh, a long-term period so that's probably why he had that the urge to make the wrong decision in the moment that that's my thinking a lot of people do and it's greed too i mean it's got to be we don't know the exact reason but yeah he's he probably thought it would be buried pretty soon it wouldn't be a big thing and he would save his job that's probably that's what i'm assuming it was so yeah the craziest thing is that so Maggie Nichols reported the abuse in 2015. Penny sat on it for five weeks, eventually told the FBI. It's state law. I, th- I think you're required to report it. I think it's, it was either Texas or Indianapolis. But it's state law that you are required to report something immediately, like uh, sexual assault or, or sexual assault of a child. And so he waited five weeks and then Nasser was working at Michigan State for 15 months between the allegations and when the reports were made public by Indy Star. So he was continuing to see patients. He was continuing to see young girls, continuing to see athletes for 15 months. The FBI also is a huge part of the reason. And uh, local investigators sat on this, didn't do anything. They didn't notify schools that Nasser was working at. They didn't notify authorities. Um, the FBI kind of just sat on this shit. And then only when the 
reports from Indie Star were released, did everything kind of come out, which is mind blowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had to be pushed to release things, which is yeah, it's, it's not surprising, I guess. But yeah, I, I think we should uh, we could get into some of the examples of abuse, which are pretty graphic. But I feel like to know what this guy Larry Nasser did is. It almost, he deserves for us to be graphic talking about it because people need to know how big of a piece of shit he is. Warning, listener discretion is is advised. advised. Viewer viewer discretion, listener discretion is advised. Oh my God, are you the guy who says it? Listener discretion is advised. (laughs) Oh, also quick, just quick on Larry Nassar. I had some general background information on him. So he started working at MSU, Michigan State, in 1997. He was the USA Gymnastics women's team doctor for 18 years. He was known as the good guy. He was beloved in his community. He started a foundation for autistic children. And so he, like, this was... This is uh, an absurd. Angel, he, it was absurd that he would yeah. do this to people that uh, knew him. He would but just he might have like, used that. He might have used his biography to do this because everyone thought he's an angel yeah so he, he was using his good reputation to kind of cover up for himself he, he published research papers he made educational videos on injury treatment he was a knowledgeable guy uh jamie dancher who's one of the olympians who was uh molested said nasser was the only nice guy on the usag staff so he was kind of like the break from the harshness of the training. This is weird though, because the other pod, just really quick tangent. The other podcast we just did with the uh, MK Ultra. Yeah, he he balanced. He tried to balance the shit he did with being Sidney uh, Gottlieb. Yeah, yeah, the, the CIA, uh, the poisoner in chief, the guy who was dosing people on LSD without their knowledge. He also treated people with leprosy in India. Yeah, so it seems like the theme is like, well, not, not the theme, but like. With really some some terrible people try to balance or out their life to make an ex- to feel better about their in their conscience maybe you're like, you're you're compensating for the dark things within yourself the dark acts that you've committed yeah by trying to bring light into the world through some other way rather than stop molesting girls he says oh, I, I like molesting girls it, it's uh, pretty good someone will probably clip that for the, <laughs> the he, podcast yeah just just loop that just from zach um, um and then rather than stopping molesting girls he said oh, i'm gonna you know do these other things and, and he's aware of it it's not it's not like an unconscious this isn't an unconscious habit like he can't like do you really think that mental illness like I don't know where the line is, but like, do you really think if you're aware, you should be able to stop it, right? What, I, what I'm wondering yeah. is, do people like this know that they're doing something wrong or do they rationalize it so much in their head that they actually create their own delusional reality in which they are the good guy? So they look at all the other things that they're doing, like the educational videos, putting out research papers, he's starting a foundation and he twists this super dark part of himself molesting children into something like a like a delusional state where he's like oh like i need to put my fingers in this girl's vagina because it's actually helping with the treatment and he keeps telling himself this so so in his mind i have no idea but maybe he has self-rationalized and deluded himself so much that he can actually flip it to the point where he genuinely thinks he is a good person which is why, maybe, which is why those people are the most dangerous. Those people are the most yeah. dangerous because they, when they you think you're a good person, yeah, yeah, it's like jihadists. When when you think that when you blow up a building, you're sending all these other people, uh, you're sending yourself to heaven, and you're sending all these other people to hell, like these and- these these people that deserve to die. When you think it's not like the people who know they're evil that are the worst threat. It's the people that genuinely think they're doing good and are committing evil acts and harming other people because nothing is more of a powerful force than someone who believes that they're doing You're good. You're delusional, yeah. I don't know. I think maybe some of that in this case, I think maybe with maybe with like jihadists, maybe. But I guess it doesn't matter after their heads blow up. But with Larry Nasser, he only did it in a closed room. I think he knows it's wrong, right? Yeah. Wouldn't he just like... He only did it in private. So doesn't that mean he probably thinks it's wrong? Or That's interesting. Like, well, sometimes parents were there. Like there, there's one incident I'll get into momentarily where he 
assaulted someone with a parent in the same room. But that, that's interesting. Like he, he was so ashamed of the act deep down that he forced, he, he put himself in a situation where other people couldn't look at him. And you're also, so when you get treatment, and you know this because you've gotten therapy and for for people who are listening. So when you get treatment oh, yeah. on a table, say you, you pulled your hamstring and you're lying face down on a table, you don't have a lot of eye contact with the trainer. And basically like the trainer and good trainers do this. You basically become. I look them in the eyes the whole time, but most people don't have eye only, contact. Only when you come. Yeah. So if you are getting treatment on a on a table with like like almost a massage table when when a trainer's rubbing your hamstring and they're trying to fix an injury and do a legitimate treatment like uh, myofascial release something like that like you roll out a knot in your yeah. hamstring yeah like I just got a there's massage. not they- much emotional connection you don't look at the trainer a lot of times I'm on my phone I'm face down I'm looking at the ceiling like to me the train like the trainer just becomes a set of hands that's working on me and to the trainer I'm like this machine that they're trying to get better so even though Larry Nasser was so close to his victims in a way there was this barrier of separation where you don't there's not a lot of human connection in the trainer athlete interaction a- after sure. Like you, you can talk sometimes during treatment, maybe you're talking to other athletes, but like during the actual treatment, there's not a lot of human connection, which maybe allowed him to block it out that, you know, yeah. he's molesting a human being to him. He may have, he may have leveraged that lack of connection into a way that he could molest these kids yeah and, and on that just, note uh, they're just flesh and bones to him on probably. that note before we get into some examples of abuse i'm gonna go take a pee real quick so entertain yeah. the uh entertain the the guests be right back how guys how long do you think zach's gonna pee oh yeah five ten fifteen twenty twenty five seconds I'm gonna go with 48 seconds on the dot he's gonna pee for a straight stream So we're going to get into some accounts of abuse by Larry Nassar. I'm not near Zach's notes. Let me go grab Zach's notes. And like Zach said, it it might get graphic, but we're here to spread knowledge and people should know about what happened. I actually think that's one of the best ways to convince people about a type, to convince people that something was evil, actually. Because if you think about it, when, when smoking was something that was common, they used images. I was just saying... I think that was 34 seconds exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm back, back, baby. Yo, so um, what I was... uh, It would have taken me 10 less seconds. It would have taken me 10 less seconds to pee. But in the middle of peeing, when I took out my cock, my tip just slammed against the toilet bowl. So I was like, does that ever happen to you when you stand up peeing and you're, you just take out your cock and it drops against the toilet? No, I would be lucky if it comes out of the fly. So, uh, so you kind of have uh, like a turtling situation? Yeah, no, I have a micro penis. But what I was saying is that... Um, uh, kids molestation? Uh, yeah, I have a, I, I have a, I have a nano penis. Mm. It's sad. Um, so that's smaller than micro. My lip's bleeding again. There we go. It's so cracked that I'm going to bleed out. Are you going to be good? I'm Are gonna, you going to survive the podcast? I'm going to bleed out, okay? Yeah. But I'm not going to Larry Nasser for treatment. I had Vaseline on and it was working and then my lip cracked. Or I could just keep licking it. But what I was saying is we're going to give you these accounts that may be graphic, like Zach said. If you think about it, when there were when people used to smoke, I think some of the commercials that convinced people... Well, not used to smoke. People fucking smoke still. But when it was like more common... Their commercials came out that showed your lungs like blackened and Jesus Christ, lungs it were. Looks, it looks good. Their lip doesn't look like it's bleeding that bad. Yeah, I but only when I press it, I guess. I don't yeah, know. I'll let you know if it gets bad. All right, and that's called HIV. That <laughs> that HIV that convinced people to stop when they saw those gra- like people on ventilators, people almost dying in the hospital or, you know, these graphic images of your organs being destroyed because of smoking. So like, that's kind of one of the reasons we're going to talk to you about this because everything sounds like a story until you actually hear exactly what happens. Yeah. Things, yeah. things tend to be stronger when you apply a story to them. And 
in this case, it's pretty graphic, but I mean, I've, it's, it's just something that happened. So we're not trying to be graphic. This is also the words of people who experienced it that have been shared publicly. So we're not, you know, putting out anything there that hasn't been shared already on a large platform. So here we go. These are, these are a few out of the hundreds of reports from Larry Nasser or from girls that were abused by Larry Nasser. This is what they said he did this again this is just three out of the hundreds and hundreds of girls that he molested so rachel den hollander was one of the original three to come out against larry nasser and she was a huge part of the athlete a documentary she went to see him at 15 years old at michigan state university I, I think she complained of a wrist and a lower back problem and he said we're gonna do myofascial release which is a legitimate therapy. It's like when you roll out the the tissue and so you're trying to get some separation between the tissue and the muscle. Like when you see people rolling out on a, yeah. a roller, yeah. that's like what they're doing. They're basically like rolling the muscle to get relief from pain. And so Larry Nasser said, okay, yeah, come in for myofascial release. We'll do that. And Rachel said that he then sexually assaulted me under the towel. And what's... You know, what's even more fucked up about this one, because either way, that's that's pretty fucked up. He positioned himself so that he was between her and her parents. Her parents were actually in the room. So he had one hand on her wrist, which was one of the reasons she was in there. And then I think it was her lower back. He had another hand. I don't know if she was stomach down or back down, but he, Rachel Den Hollander said that he was kind of like positioned between her and her parents so he kind of like hid his hand and sexually assaulted her under the towel which takes isn't some, a super graphic phrase there, there's more graphic phrases that will be used but sexually assaulted her under the towel her parents were in there he was using himself to block his hand so he was like i imagine talking to her parents and like talking to her and imagine being a 15 year old kid and you're just like what the fuck is happening right now i'm getting finger blasted by this trainer while my parents are in the room and then he then moved on to anal penetration in the next sessions and then he was then giving her full breast massages and other appointments and then hollander says quote he was clearly sexually aroused so there's like I don't, I don't know like there's so much going on it's it's almost like it's so clear the assault that you're probably shocked as the athlete going like is this really happening right now like is he yeah. fingering me yeah in a, for a hamstring injury like is this actually happening like i when people say they block out traumatic experiences to me it, it, uh, and I, and to my knowledge i've never had anything happen to me that i've blocked out but if it has I, i've blocked it out already so i wouldn't know but to me, it's like when something is so obvious, it's like it makes sense because your brain would block something out to try to protect you from it. And when she's describing these things, I'm like, this isn't questionable molestation. There's like you're literally getting finger blasted in a room multiple times with your parents there getting your breast massaged for like. And the, and the thing was, there's no legitimate reason for the injuries that like there is no athletic injury for which getting fingered is a treatment. I would say, I would say not. That has been proven over and over again. Um, right. My, uh, I keep trying to tell my girlfriend that it is, but I, like over and over again, she keeps, uh, keeps denying it. So yeah. I'm going to have to. One day you'll be there. But yeah, there's, uh, it's like almost arrogant of him to do it. It's like he's trying to say, I have so much control over you. So that, much power that I'm going to do, gonna it, do it, it in front your of your parents in your the room. Your parents in the room. It's like you, you like, and also it's him asserting his control, but it's also in the girl's mind, she's probably thinking, if this is happening with my parents in the room and they're not saying anything, it can't be that bad. But they don't actually see his hand because he, he's kind of blocking it out with his own body. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty sick. The fact that he thinks he can do that with the parents in the room. Yeah. And I, I remember one parent, I, I, I remember seeing a video of a guy and I, and I understand it. There was a dad who they, you play the video. He, he's saying to the judge, like, give me one minute with this guy and I'll beat the shit out of him or something. He's like, just give me, give me one, give me five minutes and with this guy and I will be satisfied. 
and then obviously it's not going to happen and he he like lunges at him he he dives at him but the police tackle him but yeah. i feel like i feel the pain of that dad mm -hmm. like if anyone ever did that to my daughter i would want to stab the shit out of yeah. that guy or fucking shoot him in the face i mean fuck man i feel like that's that unbelievable should that be Bring back, bring back bring gladiator. Back, bring, or, no, bring or, back an eye for an eye. Who who is the like the code of Hammurabi, where it was it? Yeah. A, a, an eye for an eye? So if someone takes something from you, you take something from that other person, or you basically punish them. And <laughs> but yeah, it's like to uh, it's it's not legal. But I understand the dad who wanted to beat the shit out of Larry Nasser because is it more fucking, is it morally fair? Possibly is it legal? No, but is it morally fair? It's probably fair for him to beat the shit out of Larry Nasser. Yeah, <laughs> dude. And also, if if a maybe not kill him, I don't know. If pedophile, so okay. If pedophiles that were watching Larry Nasser get his ass beat on live television, I think if they do do it, they have to publicly televise it because say you let. Larry Nasser and the dad be in a room together for five minutes and the dad's allowed to do whatever the fuck he wants. And maybe you even provide him with some weapons. This is a hypothetical, of course. And you publicly televise it, you live stream it. Imagine other pedophiles watching that happen. Like, I guarantee you that... It'll, it'll dissuades, think twice. They'll think twice because they don't want to get we're fucking... Not, we're just like, not in a with country. Pipe, beat with a pipe on, uh, like on IG Live. So I wonder if in countries that actually like, there, there's definitely countries where people are beat up for their actions. I wonder if that's I wonder if there's a reduced rate of crime actually in, in countries where they just like beat the shit out of people for what they did. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the crime, but or, I or publicly, uh, hu publicly humiliate them. You know, there should be like it does work when, when we got spanked when we were kids. I know other not all you know parents today are less likely to to spank their kids given you know the, sh the societal shift but it did work when you did something wrong and mom would like yeah, spank us twice your, yeah your hand, yeah right? when, when you yeah when you would get spanked it's some gives teachers you a drove little, a nail through your hand and your hand was stuck there for like a full day or like jesus <laughs> christ or yeah the, yeah recounting the crucifixion that's that's it but yeah it does it does strike fear into you. And for some people, prison doesn't scare them. Like there are deranged people out there that will do shit. And they'll be like, whatever. I, like, I hate my life now. If I'm in prison, uh, what's the difference? And so there, there are people out there that prison is not enough of a deterrent. So I, do, I would be for some cases having physical repercussions from the victim or the family of the victim or just like something something because we do it physically with the death penalty we have yes we kill people for certain crimes let me and just so, wait let me, hold, let me pee quick too i'm gonna take, I'm, I'm gonna take right. my break now all right now uh this break brought to you fuck by you, blue moon fuck you dave is walking to the toilet bowl right now oh he's running now he's jogging but yeah while dave is relieving himself i, I do think if we have the death penalty and we already have physical repercussions, which is, you know, getting electrocuted or poisoned and, and people die. It makes sense that there should be something in between going to prison and the death penalty, like a lighter version of the electric chair. Because we've already broken the seal. We've said we are going to inflict some pain upon people that leads in, that ends up in death for certain crimes like murder, rape, um, things that we uh, think deserve capital punishment. And so I'll talk to this. Uh, I'll talk about this with Dave. He's almost done taking a piece. But now that I'm thinking about it, it does make sense that we should have something in between capital punishment and no corporeal punishment. We should have some type of bodily punishment that is not the electric chair. What are you guys drinking tonight? Are you drinking Blue Moon? Are you drinking J JD, Jack Daniels? What do you got in your cup while you're listening to this? Maybe if you're listening to this in the morning, you're listening, uh, you're drinking some coffee. And coffee's good. 
It also goes good with whiskey. So maybe you're drinking both. Maybe you have just left the hellhole that is your wife that you will soon be your ex-wife that you don't want to talk to and you know you just you filled your to-go cup up with coffee and then capped it off with a few shots of whiskey just to you know ease the pain on the way to work from this shitty relationship that you're in and David's coming back so I'll stop ranting about uh getting drunk and uh drinking while driving (sighs) Oh, Zach can go on and on about uh, drunk driving, but oh yeah, we'll no, I'm there. drinking. I'm driving right now during this podcast. That's it's, how. That's how with a zoom with a zoom uh, background on. Looks yeah. like you're in a room. Right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but no, that is. Uh, that's, we're speaking about death penalty. Death penalty. So I, I was saying to the audience while you were gone. <laughs> uh, wow, there's a burp. Oh yeah, baby. There's another one. I was saying while you were gone that. We already broke the seal with a bodily punishment, which is the death penalty. We induce pain upon people like the electric chair or poisoning them that results in, in discomfort, pain, and, and ultimately death. So it makes sense. Like, why not have something that's in between a life sentence and capital punishment like the electric chair? Why not have something where you get the shit kicked out of you, but you don't die? Because it's like... I feel like the whole point of our legal system is to rehabilitate the people that are in it, that are in prison. But then for the people who are not in prison, it's to deter them from ever going into prison. And so I feel like there's a way to also rehabilitate people and then for certain crimes to induce some sort of punishment where, you know, maybe like this dad, you you get to kick the shit out of the guy who molested your daughter for yeah. ten minutes. Well, the thing is, like, what are the what are the limits to that? How do you how do you put that in in, in guidelines for in the law? Like, how do you beat him up? It's so like as, as soon as his last vertebrae dislocates from fine. his neck, I'm good with that, that. It's done. I'm good with that. Yeah. As soon as he has to be in a wheelchair without use of his limbs. That's it. 100%. You're done. The dad did his job. 100%. No, I, I feel for the dad. And, and just search uh, Larry Nasser dad charging the stand on YouTube, and you'll, you'll see the video where this dad is legitimately asking the judge to have five minutes in a room, or even one minute, he says, in the room with Larry Nasser to just beat the fuck out of this guy. And... He's not saying it as a joke. He's legitimately asking oh, yeah. the he's, judge, he's like, mad. just give me one minute. Like, this guy fucking molested my daughter. Just give me one minute. Let me beat the absolute fuck out of this guy. And then he charges the stand when the judge says no. And the security guard who tackled him said, I understand, but stay down. So he was yeah. like, I understand, like I would do the same thing or, or I would want to do the same thing at least, but you have to stay down or else you're going to get your ass kicked. Yeah, it was so, weird. It was interesting. The judge actually was, the judge made like a statement after that about this is not how we want to look on TV. We don't want to get too angry. We have to do this in a civil manner. But I, you know what? I think that was good for everyone to see. I mean, that was an appropriate response to what happened. I mean, the dad was fucking furious about the shit that went down and you know what it, he's not going to just be calm yeah. that's that, that's a normal response so yeah that was the f- the first example of abuse from rachel den hollander that we were talking about the second one michaela maroney mm-hmm. so michaela maroney she went to see larry nasser when she was 13 years old the first thing that larry nasser according to michaela said to her was to put on shorts with no underwear because it makes it easier for treatment. And he said within minutes he was fingering her with no gloves. And then Nasser gave Michaela Maroney a sleeping pill in Tokyo, Tokyo uh, summer 2016. So not the, the Olympics, but I guess another competition and he gave her sleeping pill on the flight there. And then later that night he said, Uh, Michaela Maroney said he was on top of her quote unquote for hours molesting her. And she said, I thought I was going to die that night. So that is what happened to Michaela Maroney. And that's insane. Similar things happened to hundreds of other girls where they were 
touched very inappropriately, had Larry Nassar's fingers inside them. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like actually sharing what this guy did, we need to share some of the actual abuse so that you can get a picture of, yeah, this guy. And keep in mind, the girls that are coming forward now in front of Congress and on the documentary, they were much younger when all this was happening. And so they're getting fingered and getting rubbed and massaged and, on their private parts and, and also, you know, being brought into places where there's not other people around, they're alone. Michaela Maroney describes walking around a hotel room alone at night after this happened, being like, what the fuck? And so the the details make me angry and, and they're fucked up but a lot of times with sexual assault like sexual assault in different people's minds means different things and so to actually have a picture of what this guy is doing to me is is essential because it's good to know and I, not good to know but it's like it, a lot of times there's vague language used around this stuff and when and when the victims feel confident enough to share in detail what is happening so that it doesn't happen to other girls i feel like sharing it is making the story more powerful and it, it leaves less to the imagination where you know how fucked up this guy is yeah yeah it's it, the the more that comes out the better for this, mm. even if it's brutal, I think mm. it, the the more that the more that comes out, the better, so the people can hear what happened. So, so, did you get to the point in the documentary with the part about Bella and Marta Caroli? Uh yeah, well, they were the coaches who came over from Romania. Yeah, they're the national team coordinators for USAG. They controlled the selection process for USA Gymnastics, basically the whole operation. And this part of the documentary was interesting to me because it kind of paints a background view of how um, Bella and Marta came onto the scene. So they were originally gymnasts in uh, Romania, the Eastern Bloc, which was notorious for being harsh and strict. And they, they would uh, slap their athletes, beat their athletes. They'd call them fat pig. Like they were calling young girls like fat pigs and, and names and insulting them. They're also slapping them. And so the Eastern Bloc, Romania, USSR, they all had very intense, abusive approaches to how mm. they created athletes. And what's also interesting is that um, it was accepted. There's was, one guy who said, like, oh, it's accepted if you get slapped or it's accepted. Whatever. If you get a. Yeah, and, and what's also interesting is that before there was a girl from Romania, I'm forgetting her name, but she won the 1976 Olympics. Uh, she um, she medaled, and she was clearly the best one. And she was also a, a teenager. She was a young girl, and she was from Romania. Before that, in the 1950s and the 1960s, almost all women and women in gym, gymnastics were older women. They were like in their 20s and 30s. And so... The Eastern Bloc popularized young girls going into gymnastics from a very young age, like starting at five years old and then starting to compete at 13, 14, 15 years old for the right. Olympics because they were more pliable. They were, you know, more docile. And before Romania and the Soviet Union started putting young girls in the Olympics and succeeding and meddling and, and winning everything, it was women in their 20s and 30s so they kind of changed the culture and so Berta and Marta Caroli were the national coordinators for USA Gymnastics they were running the show they were running the training camps they were making they were choosing which gymnasts got on the team they were choosing who didn't make it to the Olympics and they were clearly very heavily influenced by this abusive harsh Eastern Bloc mentality. They brought that into the United States because there was so much talent that they felt like they could tap into yeah. with the style from Romania. And so, yeah, that's another part of the recipe. So now they're young girls. Not only is he in a position of power, but now he has younger girls that don't, that might not know an, uh, enough to speak up or know what, you know, they, he could take advantage of them, basically. Because like you said, girls started to be smaller and younger because they thought that that's like the perfect, like, yeah. de that's like the perfect demographic to be a gymnast, like, like a smaller body and like between, I don't know, like teenage years, college years. So that was another, that was another way that he was enabled to uh, do all his acts on them. I wonder if the, the harsh 
Let's take out the abuse because obviously you should never abuse anyone. But I wonder if anyone's ever done a study on the harsh approach, kind of like the whiplash approach, the the movie with Miles Teller as the drummer, where you're just beating the crap uh, uh, like mentally. And and there was even physical abuse in that movie. But just like if there was ever been a long term study on athletes that were destroyed mentally and their coaches constantly laying into them and never gave them any credit and was made them feel like shit to get the most out of their performance. And then other athletes who were encouraged, they were given breaks. They weren't subjected to harsh treatment and abuse. Like if there's ever been a long-term study on does this kind of cold approach by coaches work performance wise, do you get a better athlete for that single competition when you have this cold harsh approach and you don't really give a shit about anything past the competition you're not worried about how is this teenager going to develop how is this athlete going to develop what is who cares if this isn't sustainable for 10 years because they're only going to compete in one or two olympics like we just want them to get good now i wonder if there's ever been something that compares athletes in a positive environment and an encouraging environment to something like the Carolis. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about the, the, I don't know if you've seen it. There's like a this Nike special for a, a, a girl that was a track runner and she was taken on by these Nike coaches. I don't know if you, she, she basically underwent s- severe physical and mental conditioning and also abuse. Like they told her like how much she can eat and like how much she had to be training and like they, telling her she wasn't good enough that ended bad for her like that it didn't work out she became like suicidal at a certain point and she just could like that I don't know if it depends on the person that's being coached but uh, I mean there's been study like I've heard of I've heard of like positive reinforcement working for people and positive conditioning working but I've also you know there's also a train of there's also a school of thought where like kids shouldn't just get participation trophies. Like they should go, they should be told, like, if you want to be a winner, you have to be strict. You have to be disciplined. You have to be, you have to work hard, but I guess it's just how far should that go? You know, you, you, maybe you have to, you have to, you have to, um, make sure they're disciplined, but also to not, you you still have to respect them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You have to, you have to make sure they're nourished and respected, and growing to be better, but also like discipline. It's got to be a balance. You can't just, you probably just can't lose sight of their health, you yeah. know, or of their, you can't lose sight of their mental and physical health and you can't, obviously you can't fucking abuse them. That's terrible. Yeah. No, I feel, I feel like in anything in life, the answer is typically there's a balance. The, uh, typically uh, the best answer is a balance. And, and it makes me think about the, the best relationships that I've had with coaches and where I've also performed the best and to me it was an environment where i was encouraged to do the things that were good for me not only as an athlete but as a a person you know to to be able to take some breaks to do things that would allow me to sustain my physical health um not just for that game but to be a healthy player for the entire season also like a fun back and forth with my coaches where yes there's still the coach player dynamic but there's a human aspect to it they're not just telling me what to do and then also there's a fun shit talking element to it e- everything yeah. everything is personal but f- to me i personally responded best to that shit talk where a coach would be like you know what's going on you're throwing like a little bitch out there today like yeah. you know have and, you ever have you have you had an instance where you were angry at the how hard you were being pushed, I guess? Or or have you ever been just have you ever just ever been told like you're playing like shit and like you're and in a in a moment where maybe you should have been like encouraged, they were you were kind of just like put down by someone? I don't for me personally I don't mind shit talking at all when I know it's coming from a good place. I've, yeah. th- to me, effective shit talk can only come f- from a good place. If you are talking shit to someone because you hate them or they're jealous or you don't like them, it's never going to get a good performance out of an athlete. Yeah. And I've had coaches that have done that to me. I've had other people talk shit to me that didn't like me and 
fuck it like whatever it happens i've i've talked shit to other people yeah that i didn't like and and it hasn't come from a loving place but then that leads to like you dedicate other you you, yeah you fuck them on the field that leads to wasted energy i then feel this spite that rises up within me and i have this thing that i need to now get someone back for Whereas when someone talks shit to me, that's, you know, I know they care about me, but it's just like you say, like, yo, yo, you like you acted like a fucking little bitch last night or, you know, you're uh, you're being a pussy right now or like uh, like you're just like making fun of how soft someone is. But from a that, you know, that person from genuinely some, cares about you. Love. Yeah. Come it, to me, that fires me up. Where I'm like, oh, like sometimes whatever, the best, whatever, fuck this. Like, I'm just going to go out there and do well. And especially if it comes from someone, you know, well, right. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think when people do that shit to you, it means they actually care about you. If someone's neutral to you or if someone never talks to you or just they're just neutral, they probably don't care about your improvement at all, actually, if, if you don't really hear from them. I yeah. think I think if someone is trying to make you better and honest with you, you know, that they could be pushing you positively. But anyway, no, that, that, that's actually yeah. I just want to say one thing oh, before yeah, we yeah. move on. So yeah. I, I've actually. So realizing that when you care about people, when I realize that you can criticize or not criticize, but like you can talk shit and you can call people out that you care about and that that actually helps the person that you care about, that gave me the freedom and the permission to speak up more to friends and and family and and people that I want to see do good things, but then also permission to hold myself accountable. And so I realized that if I'm not, pushing someone or or if I don't care, I realize if I don't care about someone, I won't call them out Right. because if they don't do better, if they don't get the job or if they don't stay in shape or if they don't do whatever, I don't give a shit because their, their success, yeah, their success means nothing to me. I don't care if they fail. I don't care if they succeed. I don't care if they feel good. I don't, I don't care if they feel bad. Like they're not a factor in my life. But if I, if I genuinely care about you and you don't even have to be a, a, a good friend or a best friend, this could be someone, maybe I just met you 30 minutes ago and we have a good conversation and you seem kind and I'm also you brought him in being the kind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I drove up in my white van. When I, if I am pushing someone and someone is pushing me and we care about each other, that is the way that you, that is a one way to express love is to, realize that someone is going in a direction that you can see from the outside isn't there's something off about it It, it's not the right approach that they're they say they want something but they're not doing the things that align with what they want and you you have a conversation with that person and you're not attacking them you're simply saying this is what i see here's what you're doing maybe this other approach would work you want that person to do well and hopefully that other person does the same for you. It's when I know I don't care about a person is when I see someone doing something. I'm like, ah, yeah. like I know that's not going to work out, but good luck, man. Like I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost. Yeah. Because time is valuable. I mean, when you do, when you reach out to someone besides yourself, it usually means something like you actually. Yeah. Pull it a little that, bit. Uh, that mean, yeah. Yeah. That mean, that, yeah. Let me talk closer to this. That usually means that you, you, you're you stepping, you're going out of your way. So, but yeah, anyway, like that would be interesting if there was a study being, done. That, there's a lot of variables in that, but if someone can do a study on positive affirmations and po- and healthy discipline alongside um, just a, just full out uh discipline without regard for someone's health and just like trying to get someone to be an expert by any means possible like what is the better outcome for the athlete and what who fares better and how much time how long does how long does that does the effect last so that that would be a cool study actually because there there is a weird sort of central thought in a lot of athletic pursuits and also creative pursuits Mm. where you need to be in a constant state of pain or discomfort or misery in order to achieve true greatness. It's like the people that are truly great never really 
enjoy themselves and, and we hold that up as on a pedestal of look at how great this person is. They haven't eaten a carb in nine and a half years and <laughs> they, like, train nine, they train nine days cookies. a week. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you, and you do need pain and there's suffering that goes along in life and, and you don't grow without pain. You don't grow without going through discomfort, but there is a, a way mm-hmm. to endure the pain like you only need to go through enough pain to get better. Once you are, have gone through the pain, there's a diminishing returns to pain where you need to be able to turn that valve off and go, okay, I've done my training today. Now I'm going to enjoy my life and be a fucking person. I, I, yeah. can, I can, I can go to the beach and drink a beer or, or hang out with friends Not or eat a pizza. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of giving your brain a rest because you could either choose two. You could choose a year straight every single day, going full out towards something and then burning out, or you could add in some rest days and then be sustainable for your entire life. Like you got to choose one. And people that say, I mean, I don't know why I always bring up the Rock, but the Rock eats literally fucking sixteen pancakes on his cheat day. Why does he do that? Like, there's no objective looking at it. As he's lashing himself while he does it on Instagram Live, he lashes himself and he bleeds and, out while he's eating the pancakes. He actually uses his blood as syrup. And then he burns he, himself alive. Yes. What, what is it? The monks that used to do that in the Vietnam yeah, War? Yeah, he has someone brand him so. as he's eating the pancakes. <laughs> so he connects the pancakes with pain. So actually I'm wrong because apparently the, what Zach's looked up is that after the pancakes, he burns That's himself true. alive. That's true. It's absolutely 100% <laughs> true. The Rock can come on the podcast to confirm. No, but like there's no, you wouldn't think there's any reason for him to do that. He's supposed to be one of the fittest guys in the world, but he does does this so that his brain can he has tequila or at least he says he does on instagram who the fuck knows and he has his cheat oh, day he does. and you he, would, he you, definitely has to there's no way he doesn't have tequila he's a you Hawaiian can't lie about guy. tequila uh, i don't know why hawaiians would drink tequila but it seems like he's a guy that would drink tequila so but yeah you got to give yourself rest i'm a huge proponent of, the, of that because you're trying to sustain your passion for your lifetime then you have to give yourself rest days and you have to give your brain a break and prevent it from cuz once you do reach burnout then you might make the decision like fuck this i'm done or you could prevent yourself from getting to the burnout by giving yourself days of days of relaxation yeah. You know, so yeah, changing perspective, point. giving yourself a f- fresh scenery. Yeah, so I wanted to go back to Stephen Penny for Stephen Penny. for a bit. So Stephen Penny again, he's the the former How president. How far are we in, by the way? Like when hour, hour thirty three. Oh wow, it's got about. Mm-hmm. You could probably go about twenty more minutes. All right, the coffee's getting me going. Oh yeah. Mm. If you can't go, my body's I saying will. take a nap, but but coffee's hey, saying stop being a little go. bitch. Lock the fuck in right now. Lock also, don't the be little, fuck in. Also, the toilet says don't be little it will bitch. I wrote that on the toilet. All right, that's a reminder. Don't be a little bitch. Back to Stephen Penny. So Stephen Steve Penny, Penny is the f- the former president of USA Gymnastics. Yeah, and he was the one who withheld the reports from the FBI for five weeks and. and was he was also in contact with Maggie Nichols' parents saying, "Oh yeah, don't worry about it. Like we're gonna talk to the police. Don't say anything because you might ruin the investigation." So he was telling Maggie Nichols' parents on one side, "Don't say anything," and he was mm-hmm. also like not saying anything to the police. So here is a very big reason or or alleged reason, because um, I don't think this has been absolutely defined. Well, in yeah, the news. N- not not clearly defined, but this is a connection or, for why there may be a larger cover up with the FBI. Like this isn't just about the Larry Nasser abuse. This is about a cover up with Larry Nasser and the FBI, and why the FBI took so long to mm-hmm. notify people. So this is about a, is Nasser. this proven or is it? It's this is so this rumor. Is, so this is in the Inspector General report. On the Olympics. And so this is about a meeting that Penny, uh, Stephen Penny, the head of Olympic, the USA Marketing. Gymnastics, yeah. um, he was the president, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. President, president and CEO of USA Gymnastics. He had a meeting with a, uh, an agent Abbott in the FBI. And let me let me read you this. This is a, um, a meeting with Agent Abbott. This is a direct quote from the Inspector General OIG report. Read to me, baby. You can read this online. So Abbott... 
the FBI agent met with Penny at a bar and discussed a potential job opportunity with the U.S. Olympic Committee. Thereafter, Abbott engaged with Penny about both his interest in the U.S. Olympic Committee position and the Nasser investigation, while at the same time participating in discussions at the FBI related to the Nasser investigation. These discussions included Penny expressing concern to Abbott about how the USA Gymnastics was being portrayed in the media and whether Penny might be in trouble, quote unquote, and Abbott proposing to his colleagues on the FBI public statement that would place USA Gymnastics in a positive light. So that's the first half of the quote. So Abbott had a discussion with Penny about expressing what was going on with USA Gymnastics in the most positive light possible. And that's weird. Why would an FBI agent whose job it is to uncover Mm. um, fraud and corruption, why would he care about how USA Gymnastics looks, which is weird. At the same time, Abbott was aware that Penny appeared willing to put in a good word on Abbott's behalf for the job. Abbott applied for the U.S. Olympic Committee position in 2017, but was not selected. Despite evidence confirming that Abbott had applied for the job, Abbott denied to the OIG, um, the inspector general, during two interviews that he had applied for the position and told the OIG that applying for the job would have presented a conflict of interest. So basically, Stephen Penny of the U.S. Olympic, uh, of the United States Gymnastics, who was uh, supposed to report the allegations about Larry Nasser to the FBI didn't for five weeks. And then the FBI field office sat on it for 15 months until the investigation came out in the Indy star. And it comes out that Abbott, uh, I think Jim Abbott, an FBI agent was in talks with Penny about a job for the, the, for USAG. And he applied for the USAG job. So to me, that's like obvious, conflict of interest is that you 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 have incentive as an fbi agent to not report the allegations about larry nasser because you might take a job in the the usag in in the organization and also you shouldn't be allowed to i wonder if do you think that do you think that uh penny possibly because of the investigation uh, then offered him the job yeah, I don't, I don't know what order it's in, but as so, if I'm Penny, like, say, say, pretend to be Abbott, be like, yeah, we, uh, we heard there's something going on in USA Gymnastics. Hey, I've been doing an, an investigation of you guys, and I heard there's actually there might be something going on in your organization. Oh, really? What'd you hear? I heard something about Larry Nasser, but I've, I'm also I don't have I don't have a job. But don't you work for the FBI? Does it not pay a lot? I was thinking you can get me a job that pays $4 million a year. Oh, uh, actually, unreal. So you could sit on the USA Gymnastics Board Committee, not have to do anything, and make $4 million a year. Um, The only thing is, though, like, could you kind of keep quiet about the allegations about Nasser or Done. push those to the side a little Done. bit. Um, and in exchange for that, we will give you a briefcase full of money, even though we could easily direct deposit it into your bank account. We'll give yep. you a briefcase full of cash in exchange for you staying quiet about the investigation at the FBI while you're still working there. Well, you know what? I'd prefer direct deposit, but I'll take the cash. All right. That sounds like a deal. Thank you, sir. Cover up. Thank you, Steve. They actually said cover up Thank you, in Steven. the report, yeah. Covered and covered up. Yeah. <laughs> As they um, shook hands, covered up. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> to me, that shouldn't even be allowed to happen. Like you, and there's, there has to be a law against that. That was kind of like porno acting. That's like, that was like the level of acting there. It but, was. But we're, I, we're getting I, better. I just got we're hard. getting better. I, I said I wouldn't get hard. I just got That's, hard. He, yeah, Zach. Yeah. The, he um, promised. But to me, that is like, that. <laughs> that has to be against the law if it's not already if you're a federal agent and you are applying or in job discussions with someone in the committee that you're uh, with someone in the organization that you're currently investigating yeah it's like um like if you're prosecuting uh some guy on wall street for wire fraud and you and he's like oh by the way like 
we have a job for you like that just opened up and you know i was thinking about putting your name in and like or wolf of wall street when the guy they're on the boat and he's like you know i could i heard you guys are making sixty thousand a year i can definitely uh, take yeah care, he's like take yeah i can help, that help you out that yeah i mean as an but fbi yeah, agent you 60s. have to you have to right away shut that down and yeah i don't know there's there's a lot of i'm sure there's some there, there's some loophole that people can get around where they can help an organization out while they're working for another organization and then take a job later i'm sure there's some fucked up corrupt loophole that people can exploit but yes uh, abbott at the fbi actually applied for a job at usa gymnastics and then tried to cover it up later saying that he never applied but he did it's on record and so he was actively trying to get a job at usa gymnastics while he was supposed to be prosecuting them so it's yeah, like to me how really can you bad. even pretend to not have a conflict of interest yeah it's not even pretend. He, he's basically saying look at me look at my conflict of in of interest <laughs> that's what he's saying yeah. he's not even trying to hide at that point yeah but, um yeah, that that so yeah, so there, there's another. That's another side of it, right? Like, that could be another reason why it was it yeah. was covered up. Yeah, th- there's another quote from the OIG report um, that says, according to civil court documents, approximately seventy or more athletes were allegedly sexually abused by Nasser under the guise of medical treatment between July 2015, when USA Gymnastics first reported the allegations about Nasser to the Indianapolis field office and 20 and September 2016, when the Indy star story was run. So in between July 2015, when the report was made to September 2016, Nasser was still working and seeing patients because the FBI refused to report. Um, 15 months. And then for many of the approximately 70 or more athletes, the abuse by Nasser began before the FBI became aware of the allegations. For others, the alleged abuse began after USA Gymnastics reported the Nasser allegations to the Indianapolis field office. So there were, there were, there was abuse that was ongoing that uh, athletes that he kept abusing after the first allegations were made. And then he also abused new athletes when uh after the allegations were made when you know the fbi was basically just sitting on this case Mm. he just didn't stop no do you know how things ended up for nasser do you know how he eventually got caught i oh like what 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 was the the verdict for him no just like how how he got brought in and and put on trial in the first place like what led to his arrest Oh, I don't know the specific incident. Was it, did he get caught in a, was it related to the girls or was it? So what? there was enough, there's enough evidence that there, there was a search warrant approved for his house and not in his house, but in hard drives that were in the garbage. Police found 37,000 images of child porn. Holy fuck. <laughs> found on, I think it was two hard drives. Yeah, so now I remember reading about that. That's what they brought him in on? Yeah, they child brought Child porn, that's fucking Child insane, pornography. 37,000 And then Chris Hansen would just have a heart attack if he saw that. Chris Hansen oh, came in, he would just be like, look, there I'm, ne- I'm going to fucking just kill myself. There, because ne- there needs to be an episode of How to Catch a Predator <laughs> with Chris Hansen and Larry Nasser. Just set them up together as if like it's the first time meeting or something. Yeah. What, what Larry, was Chris Larry, Hansen's? Do you know who I am? What was Chris Hansen's catchphrase? What would he always say? He'd be like, "Take a seat He's, or something." Take your cock, cock out. He said yeah, he used basically. to come in and said, um, <laughs> "I'm Chris Hansen, and this is these are cameras, and, here, and here's and here's cameras watching you." What is the what is the catchphrase? I think it was just like literally I'm Chris Hansen. Like people never knew <laughs> yeah, what his fucking name knew. was. Say, do you think- the guys keep one one I remember one dude came in uh, that was caught and he because I watched him on YouTube. They're actually addicting to watch, but this guy like came in and did it. Some of these guys just don't fucking register what's happening to them. Like he came in and he's like just kept eating his pizza and he's like i do i remember you remember that he's like you do you want a slice and he's like no and 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 he's like i didn't do anything i I came i came they actually say i came to i came to to tell the girl you know don't do these kind of things that's (laughs) yeah and then chris hansen's like oh and then he always destroys them because he'll be like 
Oh, what did you mean? And then he takes out like a, a paper of their texts. Yeah. Goes, what did you mean? By what you did you mean when you said this? I wanted to <laughs> suck on your titties that are 15 years old? What, what did you hey, mean by that? One guy was like, I texted her like, I'm going to marry you. And he, and then the, the guy's like, well, I didn't have any. Uh, it's just a text. It's just a text. Yeah. You know? And he's like, are you sure you don't want a slice of pizza? Crazy shit. But yeah, I, they should they should have. I They should have let. Oh my God! If Chris Hansen caught Larry Nasser, oh, to that that fuck. would that would be the most watched clip ever. That's, that's like Dog the Bounty Hunter catching this fucking guy that's running away. The 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 Brian Laundry, the the Florida couple. Yeah, that's like if Dog the Bounty Hunter caught that guy. Oh and, my God! And that's oh. that's the same thing as the same Chris Hansen. The same episode. <laughs> Yeah. Dog, dog the mm-hmm. bounty hunter uh, catches what's his name Brian Brian Laundry Brian, I think he's Brian the Laundry I don't know the and then he he's hiding out with Larry Nasser and Chris Hansen is also with Dog the bounty hunter like they're working yeah, together and, and 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 dogs like all right split up right now you go left I go right and then they both find them together at a, like a campfire Hi I'm Chris <laughs> Hansen Hi I'm Chris Hansen Hi I'm Dog the bounty hunter and then they look at the camera <laughs> and you're fucked they just beat the shit out of them <laughs> that would be hilarious I'm Chris Hansen I'm Chris Hansen. I'm Chris Hansen. They, they, they keep saying, tell me who you are. I don't, they definitely, actually, I think Chris Hansen met a guy he knew once and then caught him trying to, trying to molest someone. Do you think he ever great. accidentally catches himself where he looks in the mirror and he's like, I'm Chris Hansen. Yeah. Wait, what the <laughs> fuck? And then, and then the, who are you? Who, 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 who? <laughs> So yeah, let's uh, let's get to some of the testimony because we'll right. probably go for another ten minutes or so. So I get so Nasser, he was brought up on the charges of child porn. There's also sexual criminal acts. I think he yeah. originally got a sixty year sentence. He has like another one hundred thirty five years or something like that. So Nasser is dying in prison. Um, Unless he has, no, he's he's dying in prison. Yeah. So yeah, child porn. He, he was caught with that. Sentenced. All these women made statements in front of him that were abused in court. That was part of the deal. That I think it was 125 women came forward and made impact statements, which is what you say to someone before they get taken to prison, as part of the sentencing agreement. He, he I think he did a plea deal. And so there, there's video in the documentary that's extremely emotional of all these women coming up and saying like, "This is what you did to me, Larry Nasser," and. You know, I'm, I'm not going to let you control me and all this stuff. And then recently, so Larry Nasser's fucked. Like, he's the one who did the abuse. But there's still the whole question of why did this get covered gonna, up so long? To get too in jail. Yeah, it continued. Oh. But yeah, by, by, large, <laughs> by large men of different races. And... Oh my god, his asshole's leaking right now. We'll get to that. We'll get. We might do a full episode on that. Actually, yeah, <laughs> just Larry Nasser's leaky asshole. So it's no question that he was molesting these girls. Now the question is, what the fuck went on with USA Gymnastics and with the FBI? Why did Stephen Penny wait five weeks to report it? Why did the FBI sit on this for a year? Why did they not notify Michigan State University? Uh, USA Gymnastics, other places where Larry Nasser was treating women and, and girls. He had a, uh, also seen girls in his basement, like all the way up to when he was arrested. Like, what the fuck was going on? Why, why, is, why is a pedophile, why, why are people just like sitting on these files? Like a, a, literally pedophiles of yeah. uh, Larry Nasser. Yeah. Um, and so there's testimony... Yes. There's testimony from Simone Biles, Michaela Maroney, the other. Uh, this is like a few weeks ago. They testified in front of Senate. Um, we're recording this podcast in the end of September 2021. So these are f- the probably from September. early September 2021. Um, Simone Biles and Michaela Maroney testified in front of Congress about what happened to them. And so Simone Biles says, quote, it feels like the FBI turned a blind eye to us and went out of its way to help protect USAG and the USOPC, which is another uh, gymnast organization, I think. And uh, Michaela Maroney, 
says the FBI, USOC, and USAG sat idly by as dozens of girls and women continue to be molested by Rally, uh, by Larry Nasser, and she also calls him a pedophile. And so she's yeah, she alludes to the cover up of the yeah, yeah he is. She alludes to the cover up of like the question that we asked at the beginning of this episode, which is. If they're not going to protect me, who are they trying to protect? Yeah. Because always someone's always yeah. trying to protect someone. And so that is the question of like, why was this being sat on for so long? I don't know who's talking to who, but Michigan or no, the Olympic. I don't know. Do you think were they trying to figure out whether to release this material? I don't know. But let's let's listen to a little bit of Michaela Maroney's. Oh, testimony. sure. We could put it on the mic. Kale Maroney's testimony right here. You have to push the button on your microphone. Slide. Are we on? There we go. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the Judiciary Committee for inviting me to speak today. As most of you are probably aware, I was molested by the U.S. Gymnastics National Team and Olympic Team Dr. Larry Nassar. And in actuality, he turned Two weeks out to ago, be more by the of a way. pedophile than he was a doctor. What I'm trying to bring to your attention days. today is something incredibly disturbing and illegal. After telling my entire story of abuse to the FBI in the summer of 2015, not only did the FBI not report my abuse, but when they eventually documented my report 17 months later, they made entirely false claims about what I said. After reading the Office of yeah, Inspector they also falsified her report. report, she, she, uh, deeply she claims at this narrative they chose to fabricate. They chose to lie about what I said and protect a serial child molester rather than protect not only me, but countless others. My story is one in which special agent in charge, Jay Abbott and his subordinates did not want you to hear. And it's time that I tell you. In the summer of 2015, like I said, I was scheduled to speak to the FBI about my abuse with Larry Nassar over the phone. I was too sick to go meet with anyone in person, and talking about this abuse would give me PTSD for days. But I chose to speak about it to try and make a difference and protect others. I remember sitting on my bedroom floor for nearly three hours as I told them what happened to me. I hadn't even told my own mother about these facts, but I thought as uncomfortable and as hard as it was to tell my story, I was going to make a difference and hopefully protecting others from the same abuse. I answered all of their questions honestly and clearly, and I disclosed all of my molestations I had endured by NASA to them in extreme detail. They told me to start from the beginning. I told them about the sport of gymnastics, how you make the national team, and how I came to meet Larry Nassar when I was 13 at a Texas camp. I told them that the first thing Larry Nassar ever said to me was to change into shorts with no underwear because that would make it easier for him to work on me. And within minutes, he had his fingers in my vagina. The FBI then immediately asked, did he insert his fingers into your rectum? I said, no, he never did. They asked if he used gloves. I said, no, he never did. They asked if this treatment ever helped me. I said, no, it never did. This treatment was 100% abuse and never gave me any relief. I then told the FBI about Tokyo the day he gave me a sleeping pill for the plane ride to then work on me later that night. That evening, I was naked, completely alone, with him on top of me, molesting me for hours. I told them I thought I was going to die that night because there was no way that he would let me go. But he did. I told them I walked the halls of Tokyo Hotel at 2 a.m. at only 15 years old. I began crying at the memory over the phone, and there was just dead silence. I was so shocked at the agent's silence and disregard for my trauma. After that minute of silence, he asked, is that all? Those words in itself was one of the worst moments of this entire process for me. To have my abuse be minimized and disregarded by the people who were supposed to protect me, just to feel like my abuse was not enough. But the truth is, my abuse was enough, and they wanted to cover it up. USA Gymnastics, in, in concert with the FBI and the Olympic Committee, were working together to conceal that Larry Nassar was a predator. 
I then proceeded to tell them about London and how he'd signed me up last on his sheet so he could molest me for hours twice a day. I told him, I told them how he molested me right before I won my team gold medal. How he gave me presents, bought me caramel macchiatos and bread when I was hungry. I even sent them screenshots of Nassar's last text to me, which was, Michaela, I love how you see the world with rose-colored glasses. I hope you continue to do so. This was very clear cookie cutter pedophilia and abuse. And this is important because I told the FBI all of this and they chose to falsify my report and to not only minimize my abuse, but silence me yet again. I thought given the severity of this situation, that they would act quickly for the sake of protecting other girls. But instead, it took them 14 months to report anything when Larry Nassar, in my opinion, should have been in jail that day. The FBI, USOC, and USAG sat idly by as dozens of girls and women continued to be molested by Larry Nassar. According to the OIG report, about 14 months after I disclosed my abuse to the FBI, nearly a year and a half later, the FBI agent who interviewed me in 2015 decided to write down my statement, a statement that the OIG report determined to be materially false. Let's be honest. By not taking immediate action from my report, they allowed a child molester to go free for more than a year. And this inaction directly allowed Nassar's abuse to continue. What is the point of reporting abuse if our own FBI agents are going to take it upon themselves to bury that report in a drawer? That's... Uh, yeah, that's I mean, sums it up. The part of our system that's supposed to work, which is when something bad happens to you and you report it, yeah, that action will be taken and and, and the people served. who yeah, and the, the people who committed that action will suffer the consequences. When that no longer exists, she's right. Where it's like, what the fuck is the point? W like, why should I be vulnerable and express these horrible things that happened to me? if there's a chance that it's not going to be reported and it's not going to be shared to protect other girls and no one's going to suffer the consequences, why should I put myself in that position when shit is getting done? Yeah. It's, it's probably some seemed useless to her after hearing that opening up and then hearing, that's probably one of the worst feelings opening up to someone and then just hearing, Oh, th uh, that's all. Yeah. Matt, you're just like, that's, this is the worst. After like this a is, couple this hours of that. And then they say, Oh, is that all? Yeah, and she was on the phone one for of the three worst hours. They've heard. Yeah, that's insane. What What do you think for you, having watched the documentary and after this conversation and, and hearing the testimony? What's your takeaway from this whole situation? And, and it's still ongoing, by the way. There's still the connection with the cover ups and the FBI and and USAG. Like, what the fuck was going on there? So, like, what what's your takeaway now. My takeaway is that just because someone is in a position of authority doesn't mean they're a good person. That's my that's my takeaway from this. And we have to do a better job at protecting people when they're part of a big organization because things get things get lost in things get lost in the midst of the whole organization's goals. But uh, don't not question things. It's taken me a, while, a long time to realize that too, but don't, don't just trust people because they're older than you. They're, they have a degree. They seem smarter. They, they seem more experienced. Don't just, don't just be like, oh, okay, sure. I'll do that. Oh yeah. You must be right because you're, you're Larry Nasser. You're M MD Larry Nasser. You're the man. Like question if thing, if, if you have a gut feeling you know, bring something up. If there's an issue, bring it up because any any part of life, there might be someone that can take advantage of, of you, you know, using their age or power or degree or whatever it is. Always, always be vigilant. Keep your head on a swivel because some people don't have the right intentions. Yeah. For me, it's, I, I think about, I think about those things. And I also think about what we were talking about before, which is when groups of people come together and money's involved, weird fucked up things happening because on your own, like take Stephen Penny. If, if you 
asked him on your own, like, this girl is getting molested. Do you want to stop it? I'd like to believe that he would say yes. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. But when you get... You'd probably have to be, like, in a private... You'd probably have to be, like, walking in a park with no microphone nearby. Yeah, Yeah, like, there's this... There are these girls getting molested. There's a... Yeah, there's there's a girl getting molested right now. Stephen Penny, you have the power to stop it. All you have to do is file a police report. Would you do that? I'd like to think that he would say, yeah. And most people would say, yeah. Why then when you say, hey, Stephen Penny, there's 125 girls that have been molested. All you have to do is file a police, file a police report to stop it. Do you do it? And he says no. And, and other things happen with Larry Nasser and the FBI. Like to me, the system and the abuser are two separate things. Larry Nasser was going to be a pedophile no matter the situation or job he had, whether he was a fucking like teacher, construction worker, like that dude was going to get access to children in a system that allowed him to, and he was going to molest kids or, or at least try to. Yeah. The responsibility of other people is to set up a system that stops people from Larry Nasser to getting access to kids or if he does to stop it immediately. Yeah. And I, it's like, I I don't get it. Like why, especially with pedophiles, why do we have some, people are shit. Like, why do we, uh, we have to, we have organizations to stop that, I guess. right? Yeah. Like, why why do police and the law exist? Because if you take it, people are shitty. If you remove the pedophile from the situation, like pedophiles are like, like taking advantage of a kid. As far as I'm concerned, you can burn in hell and those people exist and we know they exist. To me, it's like, w- what happens in a system? I'd be genuinely interested to see, like, what are the gradual step-by-step processes that have happened in a system with something like Larry Nasser or even Jeffrey Epstein, where people band together and protect a pedophile? Like, to me, that that is a wild concept and rottenness that occurs over years and years and years and there's weird things that happen in people's heads when they get together in groups that something so evil and horrific doesn't seem so evil and horrific when you're in a group of people and there's also a common goal and you're like well we have this common goal of getting to the olympics and we have all these brands and marketing so like it minimizes something as horrific as little girls getting molested whereas that act on its own almost every single person on this planet would say of course like we have to stop that and yeah it's like to me it it has to we have to have consequences of course for the people that commit these acts on children but also the people that are in the position to stop it like Stephen penny they also should suffer a lot of consequences in my opinion you know something also very fucking drastic like larry nasser because he is not a pedophile he does not feel those urges yet he was protecting the people and the person that did and we we, you will never get to the point um at least not with the technology we have now where pedophiles aren't being born but you can get to a point where you have systems set up to protect children from these fucked up acts. So it's a That's systemic a the, the systemic like there's something weird in systems. There's there's something fucking weird that happens when systems become corrupt and people start to turn a blind eye. Like if you ask each individual person that was a part of that system, they'd probably say, "Yeah, I'm a good person." Like, you know, I have kids, I have a family, I wasn't trying to do anything bad, but the result was that little girls kept getting molested. And somehow when you get together with a group of people, that becomes minimized in the psychology of the system and the psychology of the people involved. Yeah, the rape of Nan King, the Holocaust, Vietnam, where the soldiers just like killed everyone in that village. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's so... Yeah, your, your your mindset changes, I guess, in a group. I had friends when I was younger that would act completely, you too, probably completely different when they're alone versus when they were in a group. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird thing that happens. I guess people are afraid to stand up for their beliefs 
fully when other people are watching them. But it's I not think. even it's not even like like it would be one thing or, to, yeah, to have a belief a where person. you're like you're in the civil rights movement and you say, I believe that black people should have equal rights. Like it's not a controversial statement to be like, I believe that little girls shouldn't be molested. Like why I know. It's it's really weird. Maybe someone like told you, him to cover it like up. Like you look good by coming out and saying we identified a pedophile and we this we reported it and Who, someone like, might have it might have been someone might have said it'll cost you your job if you come out, but he should have done it anyway. Yeah. Or or he's the marketing guy and thought like let's bury it because it doesn't look good for the co- it's money like you said too. Yeah. You know, there, so. there's something very wrong with the way that our systems are set up, and especially organizations and there's something weird that happens when pedophilia gets involved it's like the loss j- like take like Jeffrey Epstein Larry Nasser like I, I feel like they're examples where there's pedophiles in high profile positions that get protected and it's weird like it's besides like the, subject, besides the fact what- that it's fucking disgusting and horrific and wrong and immoral like what is it that when people like what makes you protect a pedophile that is the question that i'm wondering what goes on where you decide that this amount of money or this amount of fame or this amount of blowback is worth me stepping in and allowing a pedophile to finger girls that is the question that will always sit with me me too and honestly like could have Might been a lot even, worse. Like if if someone Larry Nasser, like if he was actually engaging in, you know, penetrative sex with these girls, like he was it sounds like for the most part he was he was fingering them, which is still extremely traumatic, but like and anything could have been going on and it still would have been kept quiet. So I think we'll see the takeaway is like we'll see this testimony again just happened two weeks ago. I saw when we were playing it on YouTube, it said that testimony in front of Congress was released two weeks ago. So again, Larry Nasser's in jail. Like he's going to die in prison. Um, Stephen Penny's also in prison. What is being investigated now is the connection with Michaela Maroney's statements being falsified in the FBI report, whether there was any sort of conspiracy to cover up Larry Nasser's abuse and like what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, thank thank you to the people who made the Athlete A documentary. Thank you to the Indie Star who Gracias. broke the story. And I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. Definitely go check out both of those uh, things, the Athlete A documentary. Check out the original articles on Indie Star. We'll link everything in the sources. And if you'd like extra uh, episodes every month, you can go check out uh, Oxoro Premium, Oxoro.supercast.tech, where we drop bonus episodes, bonus solo episodes, um, and talk about other topics like MK Ultra, obesity epidemic, Tom Cruise gets Only wild. Tom Cruise. Only Tom yeah. Cruise, yeah. The, this is this is definitely a topic we're talking about. Um, it's not always as dark as this, but it. it um, we'll lighten it up next time. Talk about the Holocaust. SpongeBob. Yeah. And the Holocaust combined. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you guys, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Peace.